special segment of She Slays, powered by Echelon Magazine. I've got three amazing, charismatic women in front of me, the stars of the program. Chiranti Kure, Ayomi Aluihara, Maud Mayboom. Boom. Boom. <laughs> All the way from Netherlands, the CEO of Heineken Sri Lanka. Um, and on to my right, we have Jiranti Kure, the Chief Transformation Officer, HNB. And in front of me, we have Ayomi Aluihara, precedent partner of FJNG Deserum, one of Sri Lanka's most prominent law firms. Welcome, ladies. The topic that we have today is a very interesting topic, and it's about authentic leadership in a male-dominated world. And all of the participants here, all of the guests here with us have shown uh, tremendous results in today's corporate world. Uh, a track record, a proven track record of going against the grain, um, going against the norm, setting a new status quo, and really uh, paving the way for many professionals, both men and women. And in this conversation, what I want to find out is how difficult was it, how easy was it, what did all of you learn throughout the journey and what can you impart uh, onto the future generations that are listening to this show? So welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start off uh, <clears throat> with Maud. Maud, the word authentic leadership generally is misinterpreted as just mm -hmm. be yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people that I've come across have used this word as a pass to just be themselves. Mm -hmm. But being yourself may not necessarily bring the results for an organization. Mm -hmm. So how do you define authentic leadership as opposed to just be yourself? How would you define it? Yeah, I think if you, of course, authenticity, be yourself. Uh, in a company, and, and what I do is, is bring people on board. Yeah. Make very clear where are we going. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is not just the why do we exist, but also what are our goals and objectives. And then be very clear what everyone needs to do. But also as a company, we have values and, and behaviors. And I think it is very important that people understand those hows, but also that I, as a role model, practice those behaviors. So if I say, hey, we are about passion, we are about courage, we are about care. If I don't walk the talk and yeah, then how are gonna people trust the company purpose? How are people gonna trust me? And that brings me to the point about authenticity. I think it is important that you create trust and belief in people. And in that, in that people see, ah, you are genuine about that. You connect with us and explain what you want, why you want it. And then I think people can uh, get with you on board. Yeah. So the uh, mode brings a very important point that authenticity is really about being true to a set of constructive values, shared values within an organization and demonstrating those values authentic as opposed to just being yourself. Um, you represent uh, one of Sri Lanka's oldest banks, a very hierarchical organization and um, do you share a similar view of authentic leadership or does your view differ? Um, well, yeah, to some extent. So my role involves transformation mm -hmm. and in simple terms, it's about change. Yeah. And people are scared of change. Change is very frightening. Change is about taking people from the known to the unknown. And in that journey, a leader is expected, like if you go to biblical times, like Moses, you are taking your people to the promised land. And it's not an easy journey. Right. So it's not always about the good stuff, the fun stuff, the fluff. You mm -hmm. need to tell them it's not easy. There are hardships along the way. So authenticity to me is about being real. Right. You know, not only showing the positives right. and overrating the good right. things, but helping people understand in everything. There's also the flip side of things. But of course, leading from the front and taking people along. So you don't just lead from the front. But you also wait to see the last member in the team right. come with you. So you take everyone along mm -hmm. with you. For me, authenticity is a little bit about that. Good. I mean, the legal profession in Sri Lanka is a predominantly um, male dominated profession. And um, authenticity has a lot to do with being vulnerable. Uh, in your career, have you had the opportunity to show your vulnerability? Was it accepted? 
by your colleagues? Was it celebrated by your seniors and your peers? Or was it something that was shunned? Well, at the beginning, as a young lawyer, to show vulnerability was to show weakness in my mind. Uh, that's what I knew. And particularly as a woman in a man's world, again, to show weakness would not make me equal. It would make me vulnerable. So I um, didn't show weakness. And I was very eager to show that I am equal or better. Um, so that was my early career. Um, but as I became more senior and I took on greater leadership roles, I realized that to show vulnerability actually can have its advantages right. also. And to be who I am as a woman also is easier for me and it has its advantages. Mm. Um, so you learn that as a, as a woman, it's something you learn as you become more able at your work, as you become more experienced in what you're doing as well as dealing with um, others in your workspace. And, and now when you look back at your career in retrospect, this assumption that I should not show vulnerability, was it something that you feel that you came up with yourself or was it really enforced as a cultural practice that nobody shows vulnerability? In retrospect, was it a fallacy? Um, nobody showed vulnerability, not a woman. Right. Um, and I was, as I started my career, very much a minority, uh, very much in a man's world. And you didn't show vulnerability. I think now there has been a change and, and we talked about it earlier. Yeah. There is a change now. So for a woman, it, there is certainly opportunity and a woman perhaps, or a man for that matter, it doesn't matter who it is. My children roll my eyes, their eyes when I say man, yeah. when I say woman, they're right. like, Amma, you're so outdated. Right. For anybody starting out, um, there are vulnerabilities, yeah. but as you um, graduate and become more senior, you, you learn to actually deal with it and you're able, you're more equipped to deal with uh, what were vulnerabilities. Um, I'd like to move to Chiranti. Chiranti, um, what are your thoughts in the banking sector? Do you feel that there is a similar uh, sentiment of women that show vulnerability at the start of their career? I'll maybe may not make much progress as uh, men in the same shoes. 12 years ago, when I joined the bank for the annual report photograph, I wouldn't smile. Right. That's how conscious I was. Right. You don't show emotion. You look serious. And Lakshman Nadraj, I have to say right. this, he always made me smile. And my colleague Callum would come and stand in front of me and crack jokes to mm -hmm. get a smile out of me. It was so hard because just like Iomi, before banking, I was in insurance. I mean, it wasn't about really the field. Mm -hmm. To prove yourself, you have to be serious. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be a giggling girl. You have right. to be a serious woman. And right. then you put a lot of filters on along the way. But then when you get mature, when you're more experienced, when you're up there in the ladder, we just laugh. I mean, don't care a toss about it because you know where you are and you know that you proved yourself and you bring value to the table equally. Right. So, yeah, right. you pretty much resonate with what she said. Now, you come from a very different culture than yes. Sri Lanka. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have, um, not today, but I think in the past, how men should behave, how women should behave, so yeah. on and so forth. And from that comes a certain set of assumptions that lead to certain biases. Mm -hmm. When you look at the culture that you come from, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how authenticity and vulnerability are celebrated? Yeah, I come from the Netherlands yeah. and um, in the, the the Dutch are famous for the boulder model. Right. We're an extremely flat country, no mountains at all. Uh, but that literally translates to organizational hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It means that everyone who is at the table can have a say. Right. Um, and whether it is, in our case, the guy on the forklift truck who has a great idea or the finance director, mm -hmm. everyone would be heard and, or even the forklift driver would forklift truck driver would tell the finance uh, director, hey, I've got a great idea. So that is um, the Dutch culture in general. Is it good or bad? Sometimes you say, hey, was that really needed nor necessary right. to add to the conversation? Um, but that is how I grew up. And that is also, yeah, Heineken as originally a Dutch company, um, 
has raised their employees. We want to hear your voice. We want people to contribute mm -hmm. to, to strategy, to execution. And yeah, I was very lucky to, to start my career in an organization like that, uh, where my voice was valued. And, and you talk about a very interesting word of um, growing up. And yeah. When you were growing up as a kid with your parents, your mom, your dad, did they always empower you to speak up and kind of redefine the role of a female in a man's world? It's funny that you ask because I have two sisters okay. uh, and I think my dad looked like, oh, I have got four girls at right. home now. Okay. And I think it, he made it his personal mission to, to say, okay, I've got three girls, but I'm going to enable them that they can do anything that any man uh, can, can also do. So he is a huge Ajax football club fan. From the moment that I could watch TV, he put me in front of the TV and watch all the, the football right. games. But he always said, Always give it a try and you can do anything that anyone else, and that is also all men, can do. So he was very strong about it. And he's uh, still my mentor, yes. I love that, I love that. And that narrative really empowers you. And I mean, that's that's what I want to bring to light here. Sometimes in Sri Lanka, uh, through how we've been parented, there is a narrative of what a woman should be and can do. And this whole concept of male dominance in the workplace, maybe because both sexes are playing into those narratives. It may not really exist. I'd love to hear your thought. Is it is male dominance something that really exists or is it there because women are playing into the narrative that has been propagated from their upbringing? I think it's a bit of both. My personal story is very similar to Maud's. Mm -hmm. I have two sisters too and a brother, then, right. but two sisters. So. I grew up with the idea that I was no different to a guy. I, I knew nothing actually. To me, I could do anything that a guy could do. Um, it was never something that was highlighted. I was not told you can be like a guy, but in my mind, I could really do anything I wanted. So that's my background. But I do believe there is a narrative that um, gives women the feeling that they must pursue a particular path. For example, I have a friend and there are five children in the family, two boys, three girls. The girls left school at their O-level stage. Mm -hmm. The boys went abroad for their university. So that is very much part of our culture, I would say. Again, things are changing. Um, I have friends whose daughters, I mean, they wouldn't think twice. They are right. educating both their sons and their daughters. So right. there has been a change. So I would say a bit of both. Right. Chirati, I want to draw something from both uh, what Iomi and Maud said. Something that I hear constantly in the boardroom and in, in senior leadership is that <laughs> there is a men's way of doing it and then there's a women's way of doing it. And I've often seen in certain organizations where uh, men come and say, okay, now, you know, let us do it. And then women leaders come and say, okay, now let's the ladies handle this. And I think it's this little chatter that happens within organizations. Is there really a man's way and a woman's way of doing something in the corporate world? Or is it just effective versus ineffective leadership? I, I think it's about a, how a leader handles the situation or the person or the negotiation. I'm a firm believer of that. Sometimes when my male colleagues can't take a negotiation beyond a point, I've been asked, can you come in and now work your magic and I don't know what that magic is <laughs> certainly not not in a not in a right. sexist way but right. I, I kind right. of found that to be a bit patronizing I always think it's about a leader's way of doing mm. it mm. and there's no such thing called a man's way or a woman's way right. and I, I personally don't like to even subscribe to it and I don't believe in it it's about all of us are equals and it's about what we bring to the table I would mean, love to can ask I, you this can I, can Absolutely. I add something to that because it is proven, investigated, etc. Mm. That if you have boardrooms that are of mixed gender, male-female balance, more inclusive, diverse, that they perform better even on the stock exchange market. So there is uh, opportunity in diversity. Um, so if, if you have your point, then you would have to really look at diversity in people's styles, etc. But there is something in the male-female. Um, I, yeah. I, I tend to agree and in the chat that Dananja and I had in preparation for this when I thought about my chat later I thought oh, I was being sexist because I was like man is this woman is this <laughs> so I, I, I thought okay I must be a little careful when I'm 
because I don't act, I would like to think I'm not sexist right. but I think men and women there are certain strengths each have mm-hmm. and I think it is those strengths that make diversity such a really the best solution um i i i i would think that women are known mm-hmm. and and there's again research um to multitask right um men tend to be very good at doing one thing at a time mm-hmm. and that's not bad that's good women might actually be sort of wasting their energy looking at four things instead of one so that balance in actually harnessing the strengths of each is really the key and i i think going forward which is why we see in boards we say um legislation actually say you must have so many women and men the ratios must be this because they've seen the results as mod saying absolutely on, on two real yeah. accounts yeah. so i sometimes feel in like senior leadership conversations with my colleagues um some of my male colleagues bring out a softest version of themselves mm-hmm. and sometimes i am more on the other side of things that's why and for me this happens in a very nice way um most of the time probably it's the colleagues i work with and there's also like i mean there are situations in workplaces where i've worked where even on harassment a, a victim being a female has confided in a male superior right i think the probability mm-hmm. of taking your story to a male superior i have i mean i don't have empirical evidence but i have anecdotal evidence to kind of you know show up I've, i've handled a few cases like that and have or it has always kind of surprised me and struck me with awe so i'm actually more yes i know mm-hmm. there's gender based like you know discriminations in the boardroom pay parity there's a lot of data driven things and boardroom diversity is important yeah. but at the same time i feel men are also more mature in their journey now and i've personally experienced this and i really want to say kudos to those guys uh, out there as well because i've really experienced this and uh, i want to say thank you for being themselves in those moments Brilliant. so i think drawing a common thread here though <clears throat> what we're really saying is authenticity actually goes beyond uh, the gender and i think it's a higher principle but maybe both genders have a different approach and different style to it um and i think this leads into my next question of how do you really nurture that authenticity because we today in the 21st century mount we live in a world of trends and labels and tiktoks and instagrams right where authenticity is the least common denominator here yeah. right and, and you know a lot of people who are looking at this thinking hey how, how can it be how can i celebrate my authenticity how how could i really be true to my authentic nature and be authentic to a common purpose and value proposition now i'd like to ask you this question a, a young professional looking at this today how what type of advice would you give him to nur- him or her to nurture that authenticity inside of yeah i think um and i said it uh, earlier i uh, the advice that i would have loved given myself mm. is indeed to really listen to what my inner voice says right. uh, to what i find important and of course i can put all the pictures on instagram and my life looks amazing but i think in the end you have to do what is in your purpose mm. uh, what makes you happy what matches your values your your behaviors because i think you only become the strongest you if you are really genuine right if i would be a totally different person at home mm-hmm. then i in a forced yeah picture of, of what a leader should be at at work i would come home exhausted mm-hmm. and sometimes people say to me much you've got so much energy and that is just because yeah this is who i am yeah. and 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 i don't have to play a role um and if people like it hey great uh hope on board and if they don't i don't care so much anymore so follow your heart yeah. be be yourself but also don't care if it's not important to you jonty i want to draw something from maud and and really as a chief transformation officer you know really focusing on culture now we live in a generation where the concept of shared values doesn't exist you know i think that you know there's a real polarization of what uh what generate so certain generations believe versus certain other generations believe, right so in uh, in a polarized culture getting everybody to agree on a common set of values and then compelling them to be authentic to those values 
how hard it is what are you doing to make progress in this uh, effort well so how hard it is i think it's not easy especially if you look at a large organization like us where there's a presence of people from 18 to you know mid 50s or whatever the yeah. different value sets right yeah. because of the generations but I, i mean on the back of my hand i have the latest survey where i find a purpose in the work i do beyond a job mm. and over 80% people had scored over 85% right. and for me i thought that was fantastic mm. so that means people across all age cohorts all cohorts mm. found some purpose in being with the organization because they were not just doing a job mm. because we are actually into financial inclusion and we really passionately believe in that and so that is a shared value for us yeah. um so you know we we serve all sri lankans mm-hmm. of all walks of life and then when you can bring everyone together for that mm. common goal i think there's a lot to do with culture in that so we try to build a family concept we we are very open and inviting and accepting of people like you know we have very um, humble rural villagers coming into our bank branches mm-hmm. they leave their footwear the uh, you know step at the bank door step and walk in mm-hmm. and then we also work with big corporates yeah so yeah. you know it's about creating that culture where everyone feels included they have a place and a voice and that's that's a very good point and i mean the word purpose right is probably and the inception of that word would probably be a very masculine word we may not not necessarily associated with the word purpose do you feel that is changing now can women have an have an align to a broader purpose for themselves well as a leader of my organization um whoever is in my shoes man or woman you'd have to have a purpose you'd have to have a purpose for your organization um i'm a partnership so i am yes the president partner but i am one amongst equals all the lawyers are actually professionals with the same training and the same purpose if you like um so i think perhaps a law firm the perspective of a lawyer in a law firm and part of a partnership is different to um the two other businesses you have here so i would say that um every single one of the lawyers practicing as they do mm-hmm. under the umbrella of the law firm has a purpose which is to pursue a career to build a practice in a chosen specialty so it doesn't matter whether you are a man or a woman you would have a purpose and i i'm not sure that i agree that a man or purpose is masculine mm-hmm. um i i would think that it has no gender mm-hmm. and so let, let me clarify let's go back to your mom my mom and the chiranti's mom the maud mom i mean if you go back to that generation and ask your mom hey mom what's your purpose it's not something that they could have answered it's not something your grandmother could have answered their purpose literally at least from my perspective was to be if you can actually term it in that way is to be selfless to be in service of the family be in service of the community that's the generation that was before us the question i'm coming back to again chiranti is can a woman today outside of organization purpose have a individual purpose for herself and would that be deemed selfish or would that be celebrated yeah so would that be celebrated i think in our cultures not really mm-hmm. because say it's a widowed person i think the society expects that and sometimes these may be controversial statements to mm. make in a recording like this but then <laughs> no one like this right um they expected to stay and look after the children mm. that's uh, right you know um so their society puts strictures on women mm. so i resonate with what you were trying to say mm-hmm. but at the same time those um you know old age uh, or generations ago those matriarchs i think they had that purpose of selflessness itself was a service to community not right. um, so uh, and they found a m- m- more redemption more salvation more high enlightenment in that in that is i think what uh, those men couldn't achieve as if that's a very good point about i want to i want to i want to bring that back to you yeah. so today when we look at women 
Yeah. I personally feel that there is a shift. They can have an individual purpose. They can say, listen, I don't want to get married because I want to start a business. Yeah. I don't want to have children because I want to grow a career. And I think we're in a time where that is celebrated and that is respected. Yeah. Do you see that as an inhibition for society or do you feel that as a plus for society as a whole? I, I think it is a, it is a plus. Um, I'm a big believer you have to do what makes you happy, what makes you feel <laughs> fulfilled uh, and, and whatever your purpose is. Mm -hmm. I cannot decide what your purpose should be mm -hmm. if your purpose is I want to become the mess, best mother in the world mm -hmm. and make my children happy. Mm -hmm. Well, good for you. Yeah. Go for it. Mm -hmm. If you say, I want to wow all the men uh, in yeah. the world by starting this amazing uh, startup, I think great. What we can do, and also this group, I think there is a beauty in, in partners and, and allies. Mm -hmm. um, so those women that want to do something, I think we can share stories like we are doing now. And, and say, hey, um, how can we help you win their trust, uh, allow them to be, be open uh, about the, the things that they face and then give advice, uh, tell them, be courageous, be curious. Right. I think there's beauty and that is what we can do for the next generation as well. And in the end, your purpose is your reason for being here on earth and who am I to judge whether a person a purpose is right or wrong? Absolutely. And I think it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You yeah. can achieve multiple purposes. And I want to come back to kind of Iomi. Iomi, you've penetrated into probably one of the toughest uh, uh, industries, probably in the world, is, is the, the legal profession. And really to uh, get to the level that you are today, is not an easy task. I would love for you to tell the audience that's listening today, probably the number one contributing factor that helped you be true to yourself, true to the values that you grew up with and achieve the purpose that you have achieved today. What would be the one contributing factor? I would think integrity. Nice. Um, I'm lucky in a way um, that I joined a law firm that is what it is and tradition, integrity in particular is a core value. I'm fortunate also to have been born into the family and grown up with the family that I um, am a part of because again integrity is a very strong value. So it was easy for me um, but I would say integrity particularly in today's day. Um, it's, it's something you can't compromise on right. um, and you as a young person, a young woman mm. or man, you are tested mm. along the way and you have to decide, am I going to compromise or not? This is something you're faced mm. with right along your journey and you do need to take a stand on certain core values. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been challenged, I've got calls from persons asking me and suggesting different mm. ways I can do things. So you have to actually stand strong and that decision you have to, it's, it's unconscious. You don't sort of get up one day and say, okay, now this value is going to be yeah. compromised. But subconsciously as you face it, you know, mm. and it's a call you have to take. And it's a call I take today. I, I took it 30 years ago. And I continue to take, so I would say integrity. That's a beautiful answer. Help me in good stead. Beautiful answer. <laughs> um, and then, uh, Chiranti, equal to what Iomi said, I think the finance industry and the banking industry is, is a place that we need to epitomize integrity. And in your career, have you found it easy to stick to your principles and have that integrity? Was it something that's constantly challenged every day? How do you really build it, rebuttal it? How do you manage certain situations? So, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it was constantly challenged, mm -hmm. but then I've had my moments. Right. And I've always relied on, I think my OCD also helped a bit, even right. that <laughs> way, because I'm very methodical. Right. I've, I've, I've got every, you know, my documentation, my, my mm -hmm. process, uh, you know, I'm very systematic. And sometimes in uh, 
probably a few years ago there was a big incident and being systematic helped me face it uh, very courageously so I, and come out uh, also victorious so things like that uh, you know your personal qualities help you in uh, and hold you in good stead so yeah I think being honest and having ethics in your life is very important I subscribe to that as well it's a good point and I want to bring that back to Maud Maud um, the alcohol beverage industry is is something at least in Sri Lanka is more kind of male driven yes but I do see the marketing and the advertising that's going on and you can see clearly brands are really moving away from the uh, masculine nature of the advertisements right from the Marlboro man to yeah. the uh, you know all of the other advertisements that came in the 90s do you encourage more women today to venture into these industries what are the opportunities that are there for women that may have a slight prohibition of coming into an industry like alcohol or tobacco what would be uh, what would be your advice yeah here I have to separate a bit local and, and, and global sure. um, because as Heineken we are of course this massive global company and we are all about inclusion and, and diversity. In fact in my previous role I made a film about uh, exactly this, right. um, cheers to whatever you order, which means technically cheers to whatever you do. And nice. that was voted number one ad in, in the world. So it nice. is what people globally want. Nice. But also um as a, a company that is represented in 193 countries in the world we have to abide we are guests mm. in 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 sri lanka in this case and i have to abide by by the law do i have a, a an ambition on the male female ratio definitely right. i also can say that globally we have the highest male female uh, ratio uh, mt we have four out of six mt members are women right wow if i look at the global target the ambition is to have 30 percent women in female right. leadership we are already at empty and empty minus one at uh 38 percent so right. that is that is great in in saying that um we always have to respect and abide by uh, the local rules and and regulations right. uh, that's fantastic but would i love more women to join mm -hmm. yes please brilliant <laughs> brilliant i like that um i mean i want to drop a very interesting fact here i want to really shift our conversation to you as a role model as a trailblazer all three of you and you've already conquered a certain mountain and now you're setting a path for those that are willing to follow all of you as role models how or what kind of formula would you prescribe under the banner of authentic leadership for young professionals to conquer not the current economic situation but the next 10 years what type of a professional irrespective of gender do you have to be to really kind of come to the 0.001 percent of your craft what would be your advice okay and under the umbrella in a way of authentic leadership because i think the qualities you need to make an authentic leader are the qualities you need to actually succeed in whatever you might choose to do. Um, and I would say firstly, collaboration. Because again, it's my background. Um, I'm a partnership. I have X amount of partners and we only collaborate. Mm. Um, so I would say collaborate. And to collaborate well, you need good relationships. Um, it's not something I learned when I was young, that relationships in what you do, not huge amount of relationship for the sake of relationship, but relationships are key. Um, and Maud was talking about the support she gets from home. So that's based on relationships. Um, support we get at work is based on relationships. Um, support we get outside work from say your girlfriends again relationships so collaboration and doing it by focusing actually thinking about and building relationships I think is key that's one the other and perhaps more important is self-belief um, and self-belief is you know it's easy to say uh, 
self belief be confident right? but i think one thing that helps you learn about yourself and be happy with what you see is introspection and it's something i learned when i was 10 years old St Paul's Cathedral I was part of a church group and my priest told me every day when you go home think about what your day has been and see what you don't like see what you like and somehow something that was told to me I started it then and I have continued it and I find it really useful so I would say the second point introspection and with introspection and the willingness to look at what you do you actually strengthen belief in yourself so those are the two points i can go on yeah, and stop no that, that 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 that's very good and you know they want to bring this back to you here because transformation is your key area and all of these values that i only talked about introspection a uh, collaboration i mean these are concepts that are becoming very hard to relate to for people today if you have a internet connection a phone and you know you got a account in a, maybe a uh, cryptocurrency exchange like Binance and you could sit at home and make money in dollars you don't need to collaborate you don't need to introspect you're printing money literally right so wealth creation has been democratized today and these concepts that really resonated with us are no longer resonating with the younger generation how do you in your career really or in the bank which it be a love this learning to happen this immersion to happen and bring out some of these great qualities and celebrate those qualities how do you do it or how successful is it so far so actually banks have become high tech and high touch both mm-hmm. now so the human to human part and human to technology has clearly emerged yeah. and what we now do is something called in a technical term talent fitment mm-hmm. we use a lot of profiling tools now mm-hmm. to understand are you more oriented towards talking to a machine or talking to a person and we do something called role based trainings mm-hmm. and put our people on the counters mm-hmm. so that if i like talking to you i my day job will be talking to people right. and if i don't like and i prefer to be tapping at a you know my phone or doing something on, with a device mm-hmm. i'll give you a job to do which you're happy at and i think that's very important with working with young people and these emerging trends in banking digital banking mm-hmm. and there's so much of uh, you know technology tools to do this in a really methodical way so that coming to work or you know working for a big corporation mm-hmm. can still be fun right. even though maybe banking is boring uh, that's a, that's a very good point charanti and i want to bring it back to maud picking the right role that yeah. matches your personality matches your uh, style of leadership mm-hmm. is it good or bad in one way you're polarizing your skill set you're getting funneled into a place that's predominantly going to can isolate you from the broader narrative of things but then again depending on the challenges that we have a lot of companies have opted for this if you're an extrovert go into marketing if you're an introvert go into the IT department and we have this kind of uh nothing against IT people at all okay <laughs> but you have this narrative yeah is it i mean should we be doing this or should we be encouraging people to get out of their shell and just explore the gamut of what is possible up to all it's almost two questions in one because i think yes we should uh, push uh, push people and and explore because yeah you only know what you have seen or what you have been doing and the best things in my career happened when i was put forward for roles that at the beginning i was like oh okay do they want me to do this and then i looked at, okay how is this going to fill my backpack right um and that is what i always looked for in roles what am i going to get out of this in my longer journey in in the, the path uh, that i am on my purpose uh, i want to to live on so that would be the advice to people i give seek what you can learn right. because my mantra is stay curious uh, curiosity also prickles your brain right. keeps you going <laughs> and fresh and, and yeah. makes you better in the end because it by stretching people you learn more right. um the almost stereotype mm. bias of yeah extrovert should be in marketing yeah. what i look for we actually do this also mm. in uh, in hiring is really look how can you create diverse mm. people because again that's almost the starting point of the conversation i believe in the power of diversity brings uh, better results mm. my cfo is an extreme 
extrovert focusing on people. Whereas my marketeer is an enormously data-driven introvert. Um, so it's, it is about how you want to set up your team. Have you got the right balance? If you only have extroverts that go for result, yeah, then you end up at the finish line and all your team will be behind you, uh, exhausted or sad. Balance, diversity, and break those stereotypes, break those biases. Women can be in sales, uh, creatives can be in supply chain. Right. Yes, please. So before I go to my final question, I want to draw a thread in. So I think we commonly agree that authenticity and authenticity is very different from authentic leadership, right? I think it's not being yourself. It's about being productive authentically to a community and to a larger purpose. And I think women can do that today. And I think bringing back to what Iomi talked about is the stepping stone to that is identifying the qualities that's going to make you successful in today's society and the society that's coming ahead in 10 years. And then immerse yourself, incubate yourself in growing those qualities and start off probably, as you said, Chiranti, where you're strong at, but Maud, as you said, don't limit yourself. Explore uh, the breadth and the depth of what the world has to offer you. And I think that's really being authentic to yourself, but also being authentic to the society as well as to your potential as to what you can create in this world. Which leads to my last question, which I'm going to come around and ask all three of you. And I'll start with Maud. Maud, who is your number one female role model in the world? Oh my. Um, a name, and then I'm going to ask you the next question. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It is a lady who has carved paths, broken boundaries. Um, in essence, it's Hillary Clinton who said, I'm not baking cookies. Um, Fantastic. So, I Hillary Clinton, pathbreaker. Yeah. Who's your number one male role model in the world? Mm. I would say it and oh, I'm very US oriented, I would say Barack Obama because what? he was good at storytelling and get, getting people to believe okay. and that what he said was genuine. He from the heart. I love it. I'm, I'm going to come to you. Female role model. Why? Okay. I have to say my aunt. I okay. mean, I'm sorry to make it personal, but I'll tell you why. Um, she was a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very capable professional, mm -hmm. also a mother of three children and a spouse. Mm -hmm. And what I what I really liked about her is she mm -hmm. took the learning she had and she applied it in a way that it helped Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and she worked elsewhere also. Mm -hmm. So she took her learning and applied it in a way that it actually made change in a country. Now, why I'd like to make the comment is not for every woman to be a psychiatrist or mm -hmm. a lawyer, mm -hmm. but to identify that you can actually contribute to change in some way. Mm -hmm. And women are particularly um, well placed to do that. And male role model in life? Mm. <laughs> I would have to say my mentor because that's the easy one. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'll tell you why. He was Buddhist, so right. detachment, yep. attachment that I spoke mm -hmm. about. Um, a very good lawyer. Mm -hmm. And also, though he led a business, um, a very humble man. Nice. Humility. So, Fantastic. Very, very easy answer. Right. Shruti, female, why? I don't have one. Uh, my mother, my two grandmothers. Um, I like Sirima Obandar and I like Maggie Thatcher. So give, me, give me one why. Women with a strong conviction for what they believe in okay. and who wouldn't back down. Um, for, and will still stand their ground for what they believe in. Fantastic. So it's a lot about values, integrity, standing up. And I think all of this has kind of mm. instilled something in me. And male role model. Oh, this was asked of me earlier. Who would you like to have dinner with? It's Barack oh, yeah. Obama. Okay, why is that? I think he's a man of principle and okay. I like his leadership quality. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think this really epitomizes our whole discussion. I think there's uh, many roads to Mount Everest. And on top of Mount Everest is greatness. And you could be a female, you could be a male, and you could be probably all the pronouns that you want to put in front of your name. But there are many roads to get to greatness. And the undertone of that road, the vehicle that you travel, the wheels on the vehicle, 
needs to be the values such as integrity, collaboration, believing what you're saying, honesty, and that's the common thread that we've talked about today. And the more authentically you demonstrate those constructive values, success can be yours. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. And that's a wrap for She Slays. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well done, guys. Wow. Yours is quite Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. <man. laughs> so much.